and it was a very strong method of social conditioning, which very few people had thought of before. Most people had thought of the Inquisition as anti-Protestant, or anti-Semitic, or anti-Islam. The fact that 60% of the people tried by it were actually Catholics began to remind historians that it's something to do as well with social control, social conditioning, and the role of the state in early modern Spain. Okay? Now, two or two developments since then. Okay, the Spanish have been very busy with their Inquisition since. In 1976, they founded an institute to study the Inquisition, the Instituto de la Historia de la Inquisición. They have a review La Revista de la Inquisición from 1991 onward. And those of you who are on the net all the time and who are internet junkies may have come across Pares, which is a portal of, <coughs> of Spanish source documents, an absolute treasure trove, which contains an enormous amount now of records connected with the Inquisition. And in fact, I got, and I made it here, mea culpa, all my information, that I'm going to present to you tonight, but a lot of it, from the net, which I have read against as a teacher for many years, and are, I'm coming to accept as an indispensable tool for research and for survival. All right? Everybody with me so far? <laughs> now, I have to say something about the origin of the Inquisition. I mentioned the two Inquisitions I'm not going to talk about. I'm going to mention them once more. The medieval Inquisition was an instrument used in France and Spain against heretics within the Catholic Church. Albigensian heretics and Cathars, please do <coughs> not worry about them. I'm just telling you, okay? I'm not going to talk about them tonight at all, okay? There was a second Inquisition called the Roman Inquisition, founded in 1542 because, as many of us forget, Italy, the home of Roman Catholicism, was prey to an extraordinary effervescence of Protestantism in the 16th century, and the Roman Inquisition was founded to allay that. And it did it very successfully, but it took it 40 years to do it. That's the Roman Inquisition. I'm not going to talk about it, but I do want to draw your attention to that very expensive <coughs> picture, which I sourced at great personal expense for you tonight. It is Galileo, before the Roman Inquisition in 1632. You all heard of him. Okay, and you know why. I need to see that no more. The second picture is an extraordinary little Irish interest picture. One of the largest and most important archival document collections in Ireland is in Trinity College, and part of it is composed of the records of the Roman Inquisition, which strayed out of France, I beg your pardon, Italy, during their Revolutionary Wars, when Napoleon took them away, and some of them were sold for fish and chips and wrapping things, and a few of them survived and got to Dublin. And you can see them there now. I'm not going to talk about them, but I am going to talk about this. The Spanish Inquisition. The ugly looking guy is Thomas de Torquemada. You probably heard of Torquemada. He was a second Inquisitor General. And it was founded by Pope Sixtus IV in 1478. Now I blame the Pope, but actually the Pope was not to blame. The Inquisition was requested by the Spanish monarchs of the Pope. And I'm going to tell you why in a few moments. Okay, but Sixtus the Fourth, 1478. It was set up first in the cities of Seville, Cordoba, Zaragoza, and Valencia, and it had two targets: the Jews, or converted Jews, and the Moors, or converted Islam. Now, what? Spain was forming itself as a jurisdiction under the Catholic monarchs Ferdinand and Isabella. Two threats to the integrity of Spain were identified by these monarchs for weal and for woe, for truce and for falsity. Well, this is a fact. They were terrified of two groups, not the Jews and not the Muslims, but converted Jews and converted Muslims. And the problem was, how do we know that they are sincerely converted? 
how can we establish in the external forum a conversion which has occurred in the internal forum? And how do we know these people are not a fifth column preparing to corrupt the infant Spanish state at this delicate phase of its development? And the Inquisition, my dear friends, was set up to solve that and it started with the conversos, who were the converted Jews, of which there was a great number in Spain, and it continued with the moriscos, who were converted Muslims. They are the two targets for the earliest phase, the bloodiest phase, and the saddest phase of the Spanish Inquisition. Okay? But the context, my friends, is political, and the context is the growth of the state in Spain. Okay? So, 1492, the expulsion of the Jews who refused baptism <coughs> from Castile, and then the campaign gets into full swing. Okay? So, the majority of the executions perpetrated, not by the Inquisition, but by the Spanish state on behalf of the Inquisition, occurred in the first 30 years of the Inquisition. Okay? Now, while this was going on, in other words, the campaign against the Jews, I beg your pardon, converted Jews and converted Muslims, other problems were emerging for the Spanish state. One within the Catholic Church in Spain, and that was a lot of people were getting a little bit too much into religion. Can you believe it? <laughs> they wanted a stricter religion, a more demanding religion, and a more internalized religion, and a more personalized religion. They were called alumbrados, people with internal rights. And they were very, very, very dangerous because they believed that they could hear what God was saying better than the king or the pope. The second group are the Lutheranos, we call them Lutherans. And for the Spanish, anything remotely Protestant was called Lutheran. They didn't distinguish between Presbyterian and Baptist and the rest. They were all hard with the one great brush. Okay? And I have Theodore de Beza, who is one of the great French Calvinists. The vast majority of the Protestants who were taken before the Inquisition in Spain initially were French. And that is, of course, testimony to the great animosity between those two countries. Now, Inquisition then, anti-converso, anti-morisco, anti-alumbrado, anti lutherano okay, the four great targets. <coughs> the Inquisition spread like a rash across Spain. And look where it went to. Seville, Cordoba, Valencia, and Zaragoza by 1482, Barcelona, 1484, Lleva, Toledo, 1485, Palma, Valladolid, Murcia, Cuenca, Las Palmas, Lodrona, Granada, and Portugal, different jurisdiction, 1547, <coughs> Goa. We all know where Goa is. Goa is a Portuguese colony on the coast of India. And they had their own inquisition very, very soon in 1560. Uh, uh, Lima. <coughs> you thought this was a cancer which was confined to the old world. It was not. Either a cancer or confined to the old world. It was in Lima by 1570, Mexico by 1571. Santiago de Compostela, which is in northern Spain by 1574, because people didn't think any Spaniards lived up there. <laughs> Cartagena, the Ilias, I don't even know where that is. It's Caracas today. And Madrid, capital of Spain, didn't have an inquisition until 1640, believe it or not. Because it was the home of the court, they called it the Tribunal del Corte, okay, of the court. All right. Now, that gives you an idea of what Europe, people thought Europe looked like at the time of this enormous expansion. What I love about this map is how big Ireland is in it. <laughs> <laughs> and how small the others look. Excuse me. But that's what people thought the world looked like, or Europe looked like. And two things that are important. A, just location where all those inquisitions are. The round, a circle around the centre of Spain. Secondly, notice how near <coughs> Ireland is to Spain. They said, you sailed out from the south of Ireland for a half a day and turned directly south. You will end up in Spain. Okay. 
So the Irish are going down to Spain. Much more importantly, the Spanish are coming up to Ireland to steal our fish, which they have been doing very successfully, even to the present day. And that map gives you an idea of how contiguous, how close, how cheap by jowl we are in Europe. Okay. Give you an idea of the New World Tribunals. Go is here. Mexico is here. Lima is here. Caracas is here. And interestingly, the Philippine Islands, which are over here, and are called after Philip, King Philip of Spain, the Philippines, are under the jurisdiction of Mexico and Lima. Okay, so the tentacles of the Inquisition are all around the world. Okay. Now, that's a potted history of the Inquisition. Is everybody with me still? <coughs> okay, no one irretrievably lost. Or perhaps not lost yet. Okay. Now, you can't study history, my friend, unless you have an archive. <coughs> Otherwise, you're a journalist. <laughs> All right. But well, historians have to have documentation to demonstrate what they're saying. This is a basic fundamental truth which people are hiding from you here. <laughs> I'm joking, I'm joking. Okay. Now, there's huge archives for the Spanish Inquisition. The biggest one is the Archivo Histórico Nacional de Madrid. That's where I work. Look how much there is. 5,344 manuscript bundles. 1,463 manuscript books. These are the papers of the Supreme Council of the Inquisition. In other words, the bureaucratic papers. I went to the archive thinking I was going to find lots of lurid case studies. A lot of those were destroyed. There's much more boring documentation. Happily, there are some cases preserved. Okay? Correspondence between the Supreme Council and Spanish tribunals, the Supreme Council and the American tribunals, the Supreme Council and the Italian tribunals, and the records of certain Spanish tribunals brought to Madrid before and after the dissolution of the Inquisition, which you're not surprised to learn, happened in the middle of the 19th century. The 19th century had a long, long beginning and uh, lasted a longer time than you might think. There are other archives in Spain, which I won't go into because they're not really important tonight, but there are huge archives over here in the New World, as we like to call it, patronizingly. Okay. In Mexico, the Archivo General de Nación, they were locked. And we're lucky because it was an, an English engineer working in Mexico in the 1920s who obviously wasn't a very good engineer because he spent most of his time in the archive transcribing documents to do with the Inquisition and translating them conveniently into English. <coughs> he deposited a copy in the Smithsonian, he deposited a second copy in Aberdeen and the third and largest is in Cambridge. So if you want to start studying the Inquisition and you don't have Spanish, there is somewhere you can start, all right, in Cambridge, okay? The Inquisition <coughs> scene was plundered, 1813, partially recovered, then dispersed, bits of it left in Peru and in Chile. And the one in Caracas was completely destroyed. Hardly anything remains of it, apart from some traces which we find in Madrid, which is some correspondence, okay? Portugal had its Inquisition, it also has its archive. Lisbon, Coimbra, Évora, and Goa. Notice Goa, abolished in 1812, trial records lost, other material followed the Portuguese royal family to Brazil, where it is kept to this day. Now, there are the records. They're huge. How are you going to read them? Well, to read them, you need to know what the archive is an archive of. And basically, <coughs> The Inquisition is an archive of those who were tried by the Inquisition. And if you want to understand the archive, you have to understand how were people tried. How, what was the trial process? And I have conveniently set it out for you here. Right. It was a system based in law. Please remember that. There was an arbitrary element to it, but it was basically based in law. So it's a legal instrument, and the legal instrument is respected. It's complicated, and it works. 